nu sous ton cou, il y a la rue qui est ma boue, jolie boue. T'as ton cœur à ton cou et le bonheur à ta sous jolie boue. T'as le rimel et qui fout le camp, c'est les dégels et des amants, jolie boue. She personified the spirit and style of post-war Paris with a career spanning more than seven decades. Tributes are being paid to the actress and singing icon Juliette Greco, who's died aged 93. I'm joined in the studio by our music critic Marjorie Hash. Hello, Marjorie. Hello. Now, she was the face and voice of radical chic post-war France, a friend of left-bank intellectual giants like... Um, John Paul Sartre and the lover of famous men and artists such as Miles Davis. In her family statement, they said her life was like no other. She really was the stuff of legends, wasn't she? Uh, absolutely. You could argue, and I apologise for the pun, that uh, Greco from the Gecko was uh, already something of a, a mythical creature. Her mother was part of the French resistance and she ended up being imprisoned when she was 16 for something like a, a couple of months or a few months. And then she came out and started singing in the, the cellars of the left bank. And that's where she met all these fantastic philosophers who went on to, to make Paris famous in the 50s and 60s and then so on. Uh, became such a muse and a musician uh, in France. So she's a huge, huge figure here and such a voice. Well, we'll talk more in just a second. But first, Caris Garland takes a look back at the life of the French chanteurs. Jean-Paul Sartre said her voice encompassed millions of poems. Juliette Greco was one of the leading performers of French chansons interpreting texts by the likes of Sartre, poets Jacques Prévert and Jean Cocteau, and composers Serge Gainsbourg and Georges Brassens. Tu vois, je n'ai pas oublié. I would like it to be forever that people hear Brel, hear the music of Joannes, hear Brassens, hear all the people whose songs they sing. Until the end of the world, until the end of time, because it is necessary that we preserve what is beautiful. In 1943, her mother, an active member of the resistance, was arrested and sent to a concentration camp. Sixteen at the time, Greco was sent to a French prison, where she stayed for less than a month. After the liberation, Greco joined the existentialist circles of Paris's left bank, mixing with philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, novelist Raymond Cuneau and Boris Vian, and writer Marguerite Duras. In 1951, she shot to fame with her first single, Je suis comme je suis. She also earned her status as a 1960s fashion icon, often dressed in black with her bobbed hair and Cleopatra-style eyeliner. Her success continued later in life, gaining new generations of fans and recording songs with younger artists like Benjamin Biolay. She was married three times, but also had a long affair with jazz trumpeter Miles Davis. Greco was also renowned for her political activism for mainly left-wing causes. She toured and recorded right up until a stroke in 2016. That same year, she lost her only daughter to cancer. Juliette Greco died at her home in the south of France on Wednesday, aged 93. Marjorie, for almost seven decades, Juliette Greco sang the musical tradition known as Chanson Française, um, a specific storytelling genre of popular music. What was she most famous for? Oh, I think it was her voice because she wasn't uh, the craftsman behind the right songwriting. She really uh, worked very well with poets, as, as we mentioned, and philosophers. Like one of the first songs she recorded was actually one uh, by Jean-Paul Sartre, you know. And, uh, and then also, she was also good at picking out songwriters before they were famous. And a good example of this is Serge Gainsbourg. Uh, they actually recorded in the late 50s, and it was Le Javanais. And um, we'll touch upon that a little bit later. It's, one, it's a great song. But um, he wasn't the, the huge Serge Gainsbourg and, you know, anti yeah, 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 hit maker of the time. Um, so I think that's why she was unique. It was really this voice and addiction and the way she 
pronounced the words and delivered the songs was unique. And she was also at the heart of the cultural bloom in the famous artist's neighbourhood of Saint-Germain-de-Prés in Paris, wasn't she? Yeah, absolutely. So you just so, you know, you'd think she was hanging out with other musicians, but no, it was like highbrow philosophers, Simone de Beauvoir, Boris Vian, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who we mentioned, and uh, Jacques Prévert. And so everyone, all those people that, you know, you go on to study as, as a child in French schools, you know, she was hanging out with casually. And she was, you know, quite young. She was barely 20. Jean Paul Sartre would have been in his 40s. So it was a really bustling and exciting time for French culture. And she was known as much for her liaisons with famous men as well, wasn't she, yes. as she was for her music? She was always very free, and that's something that I find quite interesting. So she was probably, I mean, someone described her as an anti-feminist, A-N-T-E, as in before feminism, because she was free. She didn't, like, go and start, go and sign petitions or, or take part in marches, but she wanted to be a woman who could do what she wants. And she was married three times, but her, her, my favourite love story of hers is the one that she entertained with Miles Davis. Now, they actually met through the wife, of Boris Vian and uh, they were introduced and she fell immediately in love with him for him for her she was he was kind of this um, Egyptian god and uh, they would go to cafes they didn't have much money but they would you know live throughout Paris and had a great time and Miles Davis at the time had been married in the US and had kids but had separated and um, and so it was quite complicated because the racism in France was not at all the same as that in the US where segregation was rife and uh, at one point you know he knew he was going to have to move back to the US and Jean-Paul Sartre said to Miles Davis well why don't you marry her and he said oh I can't I love her which is like the best and worst thing any person wants to hear um, but he knew also that if she went back with him to the US then she would have been treated uh, as a low-class prostitute because she was uh, in an international uh, relationship so it was, a, it was a horrible love story that had to, to start a wonderful love story should I say but had to end for those reasons they did entertain their relationship you know, until like the 1990s, he would come back to France and visit her. Um, if he saw her on a, on, a, on a concert venue, he'd send her a little note. And so, yeah, I love the fact that from the 50s to the 90s, they had an on and off thing going. OK, well, Marjorie, thank you very much. We're going to hear some of that music, that special music at the end of the show. But first, in other culture news, um, she's a Hitchcock heroine, a jilted lover, a desperate clown, a man in a balaclava, a cowgirl and so many others. One of the world's leading artists, Cindy Sherman, is the chameleon star of her own photographs. 170 of her works are on show at the Louis Vuitton Foundation in Paris. Jean-Emile Jamin delves into her world. For more than 40 years, Cindy Sherman has been her own model. Never quite the same, nor too different, disappearing behind the characters she embodies. The New York photographer multiplies herself into mock self-portraits. But who is this woman with a thousand faces? Let's take the mask off. When she was a child, Cindy loved to play dress-up. What began as a hobby, then became her art. From her 20s, she developed her unique style of disguise, doing everything by herself with wigs and prosthetics. She does her own makeup, she creates the accessories, she directs, she chooses the clothes for her models. She's above all an actress. Cinema permeates throughout all her work. In a series inspired by the 50s, she becomes a blonde heroine a la Hitchcock. In another, a fashionable housewife in the style of Ettore Scolar. The photographer exposes the stereotypes and cliches conveyed by fashion and advertising. She holds up a mirror to us, denouncing the tyranny of an ideal beauty, the vanity of achieving a youthful look through facelifts. There's a very carnivalesque dimension associated with her work, with very satiric and sometimes very ironic photos, sometimes bizarre. So there's a whole array of emotion. The comedy of society is brought to life in her photography. Niche humor seen only in the details a bourgeois woman sporting plastic sandals, or mummy's little doggy, but with a fake stuffed toy on her lap. In order to constantly renew herself, the New Yorker exploits modern technologies. On her Instagram, she uses deformation software to create a gallery of monsters. Her photos, like her last series where she portrayed men, are now worth a fortune. The most expensive is valued at $4 million. At 70 years old, Cindy Sherman continues to play a perpetual game of hide-and-seek through her art. 
next to the Right to Die film Blackbird that's out in France this week, a drama with an all-star cast. Susan Sarandon and Kate Winslet are in the latest film from Roger Michel. It tackles the subject of euthanasia, with Sarandon playing a terminally ill matriarch, as Ellen Gainsford explains. Hey! Can we all behave as normally as possible? It's a family get-together that raises some serious ethical questions. Jonathan has a hard time talking about it. Killing grandma? No, I don't. It's illegal, right? When she finds out she has a degenerative disease, Lily, played by Susan Sarandon, decides to take her own life. The film follows Lily's family over her final weekend. You okay? They run yeah. the emotional gamut kind of from laughter to tears Anna, and back Chris, again. You up yet? I'm dead soon. You coming down? Kate Winslet plays Lily's daughter. The actress lost her own mother shortly before filming began. I sort of have a particularly keen um, experience of grief at this time in my life. And so um, I, I, I have been through this intense level of communication and what it means to be a family and supporting each other through something as devastating as the loss of a parent. But there are still some moments of lightness in the film. It's funny enough to sustain some very dark themes. And it's dark enough to be, uh, to have enough weight so that you will leave the cinema going, that was something. Blackbird addresses the tricky subject of euthanasia with black humour, without passing any moral judgement on its characters. Just before we go, tributes are being paid to the French singer Juliette Greco, who's died at the age of 93. A music critic, Marjorie Hash, is here. What song should we play out with, Marjorie? How about we do one that wasn't necessarily a hit at the time, La Javanaise, which was written by Serge Gainsbourg. Her take was actually a B-side, and the song became a bit more famous a few years later in the 60s when Gainsbourg did his version, but I think it's important to look at it for the way she delivers it, and it's perfect Greco. OK, we'll leave you with Juliette Greco singing La Javanaise. Remember, our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. À votre avis, qu'avons-nous vu de l'amour de vous à moi vous m'avez eu mon amour ne 